tonight besides being here. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being here. And I didn't say this last night. It should go without saying. But, you know, a preacher's always going to say things that go without saying. If there are things that I have said or, or that I'll say any this week that you think are in error or a false judgment on my part or just smack wrong, please do not be afraid to let me know that. Some of you, I have shot my shot with your names and failed miserably, right, Miss Carol? And, I mean, I haven't got it right yet until just now. And so that, that's just one small example of how fallible I am, and I realize that. But what I hope to do tonight is to challenge your thinking in continuing in this series of lessons on an upside-down kingdom. I mentioned last night that this was sort of a rabbit hole series of thoughts that came from a podcast that I listened to. And I hope that tonight's lesson, living as pilgrims and exiles in an upside-down kingdom, will be challenging. I ask you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. And as you're turning there, the ideas that are present in Scripture about how different God thinks, how different Jesus was, the ironies, the otherworldly ideas that are present, the countercultural way that Christians were supposed to live. And, and, and brothers and sisters, I don't, I don't think we can appreciate this very much. When Jesus came as a Jew, he told Jews to basically quit being the Jews that they'd been around all their life. He says, you can't be like what you've always heard and always been and be my disciple." That's what he meant in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. And I think sometimes, since we live here, we're engrossed in this culture, we might think that our repentance and that our perception of culture and the way that we live our lives, well, we may just have to tweak it a little bit. I don't think that's biblical. We studied last night in 2 Corinthians 5 about everything must become new. I've heard people say in the past, well, all she needs to do is get baptized. I'm like, mm, I'm thinking that's underselling baptism. Because baptism is a death to sin, raised to walk in newness of life, not just the same old life, just tweaking it a little bit. That's, that's not what the gospel says. And brothers and sisters, we need to be ready to change our mind when our king tells us to. He is our king, and he has earned that title by what he has done in giving himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Hopefully tonight we'll see the idea, not just in the songs, thanks, brother. I'm, I'm thinking, wow. It's like Maybe all of tonight's lesson will sink in on me about and the reason I, brought, I bring up these lessons is because I'm very comfortable in my life. I'm a, a white, middle-aged, fat guy who has a lazy boy and plenty of food. I got two refrigerators at my house. <laughs> One just for drinks. Now think about that for a minute, y'all. Think about how comfortable my life is. That can be a pernicious materialistic way of living that I can get wrapped up in that mindset and in that way of life so much that I think I'm doing all right by coming to church on Sunday that I think I'm okay leading a song or two and I might very well miss the kingdom because I'm not a pilgrim because I'm at home here I just happen to be religiously at home here I think from reading the New Testament that's not going to cut it. The idea of being a pilgrim or an, or an exile is instructive. And what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct honorable among the unbelievers, so when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. 
So submit yourselves to the ordinances of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now what we know about 1 Peter is it was written to a group of Christians scattered across the Mediterranean world and they were facing persecution because they were Christians. We like to think in America that we've been persecuted or we're about to be persecuted and we need to hush because we haven't faced anything these people did. If we read our New Testament now you know, we, there, may, there, may, there may be some truth to where the, the, the nation is going. But we need to stop overplaying that and start getting real about the person in the mirror that we look at instead of complaining about how bad the world is. Because what did Peter say here? He says, you have a responsibility to these people that you're around every day. And what he says to them first and foremost is the way that we live as a Christian is very different from the way people who are at home in this world live very different what we looked at last night in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21 is we are citizens of heaven first now we live in a time when people argue about citizenship right I mean after all I'm in southern Arizona we, we people argue about citizenship this and citizenship that and immigration MDV. it took something to be a citizen of the Roman kingdom the Roman Empire. Not many people were. And along comes King Jesus, and he offers citizenship to everybody. No worldly empire ever did it like that. And apparently, there aren't many, if any at all, who still do. There's always a quota, there's always an argument, there's always a wall. There's always a law. Praise be to God that we have a king who opens his kingdom to any and everyone who would come to him in faith. So we live as citizens of heaven. And to our friends and neighbors in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 5, we are ambassadors for Christ. I've never been around an ambassador. But I have an idea of the integrity that they're supposed to live with because they represent something larger than themselves. Is that what we portray in our lives? That we are ambassadors for Christ? Now, while the we in 2 Corinthians 5 might be talking about the apostles, I think the principle is even larger when Jesus says, you, my people, in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And again, I'm not sure how much we appreciate the value of salt. We can go and get Morton salt or Aldi salt or Kroger salt. I'm not brand specific on my salt. We can go buy salt. Easy. But if you're a fan of history, I'd like you to look up this part of the crown jewels of Britain. It's called the Exeter Salt. It's what royalty kept their salt in because of how precious it was. And it is this rubies and diamonds and, and, and you know, they dolled everything up in the British Empire. But, but they did that because salt was important and expensive. And as the salt of the earth, we have a responsibility from our king to the world and to give some depth to this idea of being a pilgrim and not necessarily at home here but a citizen of heaven turn with me back in your Old Testament to Jeremiah chapter 29 the picture in front of you is an artist's rendition of the Ishtar gate in Babylon 
If you're ever in Chicago, I would ask that you would go to the Oriel Institute at the University of Chicago's campus on the south side, on the lakeshore, and walk in and see some of the tiles from this gate in our country. Not mock-ups, actual tiles from this gate. And then you realize you're walking past something that Daniel walked by. Now look at here, brothers and sisters. If that, if that doesn't put a chill up your spine, I, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't know what to tell you. But imagine Daniel. Imagine Daniel, or you just being a Jew, really trying to be faithful to God as an exile here, realizing what this government has done. Except for the exiles in Babylon, they have exterminated the rest of your country and countrymen, or are about to. And you also realize that it's not Nebuchadnezzar's fault. This is the judgment that God had promised them. If you are unfaithful to me and rebel against me and keep being spiritual whores with idols, I will do to you what I did to Egypt. And he did. God keeps his promises. But that doesn't mean it's going to be easy to be a Jew in Babylon. As a faithful Jew, should I be looking to escape? Should I be looking to revolt? Should I plan an uprising so that we can get some good godly people on the throne? Does that sound something like a Jew would have done in Babylon? Or should I assimilate into the culture? You know, kind of like how Joseph did in Egypt. Should I assimilate and start looking and acting like a Babylonian? Should I do that? After all, God sent these guys to punish us. Maybe we should be a part of this country now. What would we choose? And what we have in Jeremiah chapter 29 is a letter. It's the epistle of Jeremiah to the exiles. That's what I call it. But read along with me this letter. Jeremiah is still alive, but there the days of Jeremiah and the people back in Palestine are numbered. In Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord, for thus says the Lord, When seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. You will seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. You'll notice there's this passage. There's this passage that gets ripped out of its context, and it's applied to 21st century Americans. Let's deal with this context first before we start taking something that was written 600 years before Jesus and applying it to us 2,000 years later. Here is Jeremiah's exile strategy. 
here's what you got to do, disciple of God. If you're living there in Babylon, the first thing you have to recognize is that you were in Babylon on purpose. It's not a fluke. It's not a chance. It's not a historical oddity. You're there because I sent you there. It's not Nebuchadnezzar's fault. I sent you there. And what I want you to do is I want you to live. Now, can you imagine being a middle-aged couple, being sent there? I don't know if there were couples after. I mean, and start wishing for the good old days. If you've got some gray in your hair, or maybe if you've lost it, have you, uh, have you started reminiscing about how the good, the good old days were? And then remember what your king said in Luke chapter 9 about verse 62. Then looking back. God told his people in exile, he said, don't you be looking back. you got to live forward. He says, I want you to live there. I want you to build your gardens there. You know, like the gardens you, you, you sowed back over here in Jerusalem? He said, I want you to build gardens there because you gotta, you got to live and you got to eat. And then, interestingly enough, he says, get married there. We need a 30-second on that one. I thought he said don't intermarry. I got questions. And I don't always have a lot of answers. But I know what he said here. He says, live there. Live there. Get married there. Let your sons marry daughters. Let your daughters marry sons. Have grandchildren. Hey, hey, grandchildren. Beautiful thing. I told you last night. I got my second one a couple of weeks ago. It's a beautiful thing to have grandchildren. He says, you can enjoy your life there with having grandchildren there. Now, here's a problem. Can you enjoy life as an exile? Can you enjoy life as a stranger? Can you actually live a life that would be pleasing to God in a place where you are in exile and a stranger and you wished you were somewhere else? Well, apparently you can. And he says, and even more, while you're there, pray for them. You see, Jesus wasn't the first one to say, pray for your enemies. Jeremiah told him to do that 600 years before Jesus did. So apparently, this has always been a neighborly nest to God's people. Apparently, is a thread that runs the gambit of the Bible story. Pray for them. Do good to them. Be at home there. Don't wish you were somewhere else. Live where I put you. And live. Now, what God is pushing against is vengeance. Because of their patriotism, misplaced or rightful, there might be vengeful thoughts against the Babylonians. And God subverted that and said, no vengeance, pray for them. No vengeance, do good to them. And when the time's right, I'll come for you. Now the thing is, most of that whole generation died there. Generations didn't live 80, 90, 100 years back then very often. But he says, I'll come for you when the time is right. And the time is going to be 70 years. But when you think about a contemporary of Jeremiah in Daniel chapter 3, when you think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, here, here comes a story about what being at home in Babylon meant. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace gives another aspect to this exile strategy. Because Daniel... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We, we always know them by the Babylonian names, not the Jewish names. I don't know why. But the four of them were actually serving the king who leveled Jerusalem. Unpatriotic? If 
depends on who you ask. But they served in Nebuchadnezzar's court. And the three friends, when Nebuchadnezzar got arrogant, imagine that. Imagine that, a politician and a world leader getting arrogant. I'm shocked by that. Just shocked, as you all are, I'm sure. And he builds this nasty gold statue. Instead of letting just Daniel's dream be Daniel's dream and not taking it literally, Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm not only going to build a head of gold, I'm going to build a whole thing of gold, and everybody's going to worship this idol, right, boys? And all of his little minions say, yes, boss, yes, uh -huh, uh -huh, you're right, you're right, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the greatest ever, which is what minions in politics do, right? Except Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We view them as courageous and faithful. There are other, other opinions depending on their perspective. To some, they were traitors. How dare you not serve the court? How dare you not do a simple thing that our king asked us to do? Don't you know that we live in his good pleasure? Which was true because of what Nebuchadnezzar tried to do to him. To others, they were just rebellious. And deserved what they got. But to God, they were faithful. In many ways, this story and others like it, like Daniel's story, praying years later, even Esther and Mordecai, helps us frame the idea of what it means to be faithful when you're in a challenging position. And what I'd like to do, brothers and sisters, is I would like to take these principles and principles even from Jeremiah 29 and kind of outline something for us because we are sojourners. It's not just a song. It's a faith-based mentality and perspective. We can't sing, this world is not my home here tonight, and then go out and act like we live in Babylon and everything's just fine. We need to actually live like this world is not my home. We need to live like citizens of heaven. We need to live like we are what Peter says we are. And what Peter says we are are exiles and pilgrims and sojourners as children of God. I think that the people that Peter wrote to probably had an easier time adopting this perspective than we do. Because our culture is comfort-based. Remember the drive through analogy last night? And how comfortable we are getting upset and lack patience when people in front of us are taking too long in the drive through How comfort-based everything is in our society. And there is a perniciousness to this mentality that everything needs to be the way that I think it ought to be. From the weather, to politics, to food, to my neighbors, everything needs to be for my comfort. That's not the mindset of a pilgrim. By nature of being a pilgrim or a sojourner or an exile, there's a bit of uncomfortableness inherent in that mentality. And we need to be more comfortable with that rather than our own comfort. Now again, I understand the irony. You can see me in profile. You ought to see my chair at home. Whew, nice. But if my chair becomes my idol, if the way I live becomes my idol, then I'm not in exile. Now, one of the things that can happen is because the sky is falling, right? The sky's falling, right? Whether it's inflation, immigration, politics, abortion, transgender, the sky is falling. So let's run. Let's run away. Let's go to Montana. I wonder why land prices are so high in Montana. Because, because there is a very human temptation to escape. 
to run away. We're called not to go out of the world, but have an influence on the world where we are, just like the pilgrims and the exiles in Babylon. He didn't say run off to Persia. He didn't say run off to India. He didn't say run north. He said stay there and do good. Now, I'm not saying, Miss Linda, when you're moving to California tomorrow, that you're running. There might be many people here tonight say you're running into the mouth of the beast rather than away from it, but yeah, that's a different... No, no, I no amen in that. Don't no, stop it. <laughs> but the influence in the world that we are supposed to be offering is tempered by what is at the very core of our being. And that's an intractable loyalty to our king. First, foremost, and always, we are faithful to God because He has been faithful to us. And we are citizens of heaven first. We're not Americans first. And to Chinese Christians, they're not Chinese first. And the Americans go, Amen. No, no, no. It, it, you see, this gospel, these principles are international in scope. Because Chinese people can be just as proud of their country as Americans can be. I'm not arguing history. I'm talking about patriotism and mindset here. Nationalism is not... It's a real problem at times because we have this pride. It's taught and it's expected. Now please, understand. I don't live anywhere else. You can call me unpatriotic tonight afterwards if you'd like. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we got to get this mindset right or the thing that we say that we want most, we may not get. Because walking by faith is important. Becoming a citizen, understanding and having a perspective of being a citizen of heaven first, far more and this preaches to people who lived in Babylon or Rome or the United States. Which is why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did what they did. Because they were a citizen of heaven first. Not a servant of Nebuchadnezzar. Which is why Daniel kept praying. Even though the Persians said, no more. Which is why Esther took that chance and walked into her husband's room where she could have died. Which is why Christians were not willing to sacrifice to Caesar. Isn't that interesting? They weren't willing to sacrifice to them, but they were commanded and prayed for him. Friends, we don't have it that bad. We ain't praying for Nero. And you can argue with me from now until Gabriel blows his horn. The American government is not as corrupt as the Roman government that these first century Christians lived under. They wouldn't go along with them, but they would pray for them. How are we doing along that line? Most of the brothers and sisters that I've been around, including the one that looks in the mirror, probably spends more time complaining about the government rather than praying for it. And if we believe in the power of prayer, maybe we ought to think about that timeshare. And since we are citizens of heaven first, Paul told Timothy, lay your hands on no one hastily. We need to be careful who we put forward as our guy or gal, since I believe in Title IX. We need to be careful about who we advance and who and what we defend it was not even the minds of fiction writers in the ancient Near East that normal people like you and me could one day have vo a voice in the government. That's fiction. What we think is obvious, they would have been flabbergasted at. But I'm going to say something that some might consider unpatriotic right now. Voting is not our greatest civic responsibility. Being in exile for God is. Amen. 
it is imperative for us. Let me just keep going here. We don't have to choose between overthrowing the government and completely assimilating here. We can seek the peace of the city while being good and faithful exiles. What was true to Israelites in Babylon, what was true to Christians in the Roman Empire, what is true to Christians in communist China, what is true now in our very own Babylon is still true. We seek the peace of the city, but the city is not our idol. We can seek the peace of the city and do good and to be salt and light, but all the while remembering where our loyalty lies. And that is an ever-present personal struggle because, honestly, folks, we got a lot of time because we don't have to work to live that hard. We have a lot of free time, a lot of free time, a lot of free time. And if we're pilgrims and exiles and sojourners, what we're going to understand is we're not going to turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to the gross inhumanities that happen here in Babylon. Abortion is a gross inhumanity. But so are racist policies. The transgender ideas are wrong. But so is materialism and redlining in cities. Now, if you don't know what that is, talk to an African American. You see, white people don't have to worry about redlining because you know who did the redlining? White people. We can't turn a deaf ear or a blind eye to gross inhumanities, even in our history. Because, well, I didn't do it. Why should I be bothered with it? Do you know what Daniel prayed when he prayed? He says, Father, we have sinned. And he's talking about the Jews as a nation and the Jews about their history. If we're going to uphold Daniel, then maybe we need to pray like Daniel and acknowledge the sins of our very own country as an exile here. Well, I didn't do it, Mark. Do you really think that absolving yourself of personal accountability from something that maybe you had nothing to do with? What did Daniel do? He didn't do anything except serve his God, become a eunuch because God chose him to be there, and then he prayed in, in humbly asking God for help and a perspective. Brothers and sisters, I'm, going to put it, I'm not going to put it for you because I don't know you. Maybe you've got this down. I've got a lot to learn about being an exile. But I don't think I'm the only one. We can pray for Nebuchadnezzar. Because they could. We could have prayed for Nero. Because they were commanded to. And regardless of the party and the shenanigans that happen to get whoever leads those parties into power, we can pray for them too. Have you studied ancient history and how some people got the throne? Come on now. And it seems that God was not so much worried about how they got there as what they were going to do when they got there. Do we believe in a sovereign God or not? Wherever we live and whatever we're doing, we are called to live courageously faithful lives regardless of the personal cost. And I'm not talking about paying $4.50 for gas. There was a very personal cost paid by Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I'm not going to paint that picture, but look up the definition of a eunuch. God chose for that to happen to them there and called them to be a servant there. As an exile and a pilgrim living at a specific time, we can be humbly heartbroken 
over our sins personally and over the sins of the past and the sins of the Babylon that we live in. It's all right to have a transparent view of how things have been and be brokenhearted over the mistreatment of people, even if it wasn't your people. I got to go to Gettysburg, and as a history student, I graduated with a history major and a math minor. I got, if you've ever been to Gettysburg, it's beautifully laid out, and they've got statues there, and they've made it real pretty, even though it was an ugly, ugly place. And I got to the high mark of the Confederacy, and not because I'm from Kentucky, because it wasn't part of the Confederacy, I cried. I cried because 40 or 50,000 Americans died there fighting each other. And it broke my heart because on both sides they were praying to the same God. The God that said, Thou shalt not kill. Perhaps it would behoove us to be more broken hearted over the sins of the past and the Babylon that we live in so that we can be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. That's what our God tells us. As a disciple, wise. Now wisdom, you got to have some knowledge in order to be wise. You can't stick your head in the ground. You can't just only fill yourself with all the stuff that you like. But we need to be wise and innocent so that we can be salt and light. We love everyone, but no one is an idol. Maybe this is just my perspective, and you can argue with me. I'm free after whatever time breakfast is tomorrow. We could talk about this if you want. But isn't it odd that politicians have become idols now? What the Beatles used to be, maybe, maybe you were a Beatles fan and you screamed and threw things at Eagle Bird Humperdinck when you were little, I don't know. But, but instead, of, instead of musicians and artists now, we raise up these political idols and sacrifice to them. We love everyone. But we know who really protects us and loves us. Now again, here comes my hedge. First responders, military folks who are out to protect, thank you. But as a citizen of heaven, pilgrims and exiles are protected by a sovereign God until he decides not to protect us anymore. Because there, there might come a time I mean, if he told Jesus no in the Garden of Gethsemane, he might tell, him, he might tell Christians in America no at some point. We still going to be faithful? We still going to trust him? Since we make faithful being our first priority, we can take the accusations of being contrary. We can make the accusations of being unpatriotic or even rebellious with patient, humble, exile mentality without whining now see there, there's another thing there's another thing if we learn anything from the Israelites from Egypt to Sinai and following what does God think of his people when they whine it? now I get tired of food after about three days 40 years y'all 40 years I got, I got a ways to go before I start wagging my crooked finger at the Israelites after Sinai. I don't know about y'all, but I got a long way to go because in my comfort and what I like, you know, I had Italian tonight. Thank you, Bill and Lorraine. I had Mexican the other day. I love me a cheeseburger every now and then. Well, probably more than every now and then. But you see, I have this, I have this variety that's at my pleasure and at my comfort that I have become accustomed to, and I wag my finger. Well, if I'd have been there, I wouldn't have complained. Yeah, right. Because I don't have an exile, sojourning, 
pilgrim mentality like I should yet. And I need to live my life as an exile. And I don't need to be critiquing everyone else. And I need to live my life without complaining so that I can be harmless, a harmless child of light, wise as serpents, harmless as doves, so that others may ask about my faith. Even if the critiques are coming from my brethren. Because after COVID, I know what brethren do with other brethren. They critique them, even though the New Testament is full of do not judge your brother. Right? Now, can you imagine Daniel or Esther or Paul making their real and lasting happiness and focus on what was transpiring around them? Like, who was going to be emperor? Can you imagine Paul... His whole life, everything he wants to talk about outside of work and family time is, well, who's going to be the next proconsul? Who's going to be the next emperor? It seems to have become a fascination with us. Now, are we concerned? Well, of course we're concerned. This is where we live. This is where our children live. This is where our grandchildren, God willing, are going to live. We are concerned. Will we pray? Well, that's a matter of if, if we're going to walk by faith or not. I know there were some folks who hated the fact that Obama got elected and wouldn't pray for him, or they pray that prayer that he would be taken out. I'm just like, stop it, y'all. And as soon as the tides changed, Mr. Trump got elected. Oh, we're praying. We're proud to be American again. And, 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 and I'm wondering about this roller coaster. I know, by the way, somebody needs to tell me why that's roller coaster road out there. <laughs> but America's been on a roller coaster, hasn't it? And there's up and down and up and down with the politics and up and down with the culture and all this sort of stuff. What we need is patient endurance. And being a pilgrim, going home. Should we be anxious? Our king said not to. But if you get that way, what are you supposed to do? Pray. That's right. And what do we know about prayer? A faithful person who prays, God listens to. And sometimes he intervenes and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he says yes and sometimes he says no. And what does the faithful disciple do? He does what Habakkuk did. Do you remember the story of Habakkuk? Habakkuk was a man who said the just shall live by faith. And what we have to understand is living by faith sounds like this. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, the produce of the olive fail, and fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from a fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. And he said that, after God blew his doors off and says Babylon is coming. He, said, he, he prayed to God. He says, God, you've got to do something about this wicked country. You've got to do something about these people. And God said, I am going to do something. And you're not going to believe it. And he told him, he says, the Babylonians are coming. And Habakkuk said, whoa, 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 whoa. See, he was the first prophet to call the timeout. You, you, you know, I'm calling timeouts in my sermon. Habakkuk was the first one to go, oh, well, hey, hang on here, boss. You're going to do What? You see, what God was trying to get him to do was actually change the way that he was thinking. And he says, I'm going to do something upside down. Because of Habakkuk, what you think needs to happen isn't what I think needs to happen. Because we believe in a sovereign, loving, gracious God, we trust him with intractable loyalty and put ourselves in his hands without grumbling, without complaining, and we live as a pilgrim longing for home. That's what we do. And what I would hope tonight is that this short lesson 
will cause us to actually live by faith. Live by real faith. Not trying to hold on to here. Not trying to save here. Because since God is sovereign, you know what your grandparents and my grandparents used to think about America? The same thing we're thinking about it now. Oh, what's going to happen to the church? See, old people, they talk about, oh, what's going to happen? It's, it's getting bad. It's getting worse all the time. And they misquote 1 Timothy 4. Times are coming. And, I, and it's like, come on, y'all. Instead of saying that the sky is falling, why don't we get down on our knees and pray and then get up and pray for the city and do good and live our lives? God doesn't want us to have a spirit of fear. He wants us to live Live, Christian. Live like a disciple. Live being a, an example. Live offering a cup of cold water to anyone. Live and pray for your enemies. Don't despise other people. Love them. Serve them. Then, then a little leaven might leaveneth a whole lump in the opposite way. That's our calling. May our calling be sure and our faith be strong. Well, let's all look forward to going home. If you haven't been looking forward to going home, if there is a sense of dread in your soul because of sin, if there is a dread in meeting your God in judgment, may I suggest that you have faith and not be in some craven fear of the one who served you and offered himself for you. May I ask you to put your life in his hands because he gave his life so that you could have life. He gave his life and surrendered to evil to defeat evil so that we could have hope and peace and joy and confidence and live like he wants us to live if you haven't been and we can help or if you're ready to become a disciple and a pilgrim on the way to heaven